Удрибо в дълги години е работил като а, инженер в НАСА а, и след това а, като един от главните консултанти към Европейската комисия по проекта Коперник и той е тук да ни разкаже за това. Удрибов, споядай. So, first of all, how many are you? This is just uh, crazy. It's a personal pleasure for me to see such young people, because you are all extremely young, and this is great, to see that you are interested in such a conference focused on science-related aspects. This is great. So even before starting, I would like to tribute an applause to you. Make an applause to yourself. <laughs> this is just great. And thank you, Pet, for, for the introduction. By the way, I just learned yesterday evening that the short version of my name, I, actually all my friends call me Udri, and Udri in, in back is <laughs> 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 something uh, super cool, so I, I'm even, uh, <laughs> I'm having even more fun. But okay, let's start. As you see from the background, background slide, we have our beautiful Earth and the satellite. So, I think you understood that we are going to speak about satellites. And of course, after such an interesting presentation from Stephen about the, the philosophical questions of our life, I have a hard task to, <laughs> to amuse you. But anyway, this is your beautiful Sofia. This is an optical uh, image from a European satellite paid with your money, paid with the taxpayer money, which is called the Sentinel-2, and we are going to understand uh, very soon what this is about. And this is a, the, a picture that you could download uh, yourself eh, without paying. But is that it or about the satellites? No, it's not only about beautiful pictures from space, it's much more. In a few words, we could say that satellites make our life better. When you speak about Earth observation, which is about gathering data and information about our planet, we use the term uh, remote sensing techniques. So, sensing from remote, sensing remotely. If you stick to the meaning of this uh, expression, it's something that is very generic, because also our eyes are a remote sensing device. I can see you from remote, thanks to my eyes. So this is also remote sensing. And the most intuitive way of describing the satellites is that you bring your smartphone in orbit, you travel into space, and with your, smart with your smartphone you shoot some pictures from once in a while. So this is the, the basic. But then you have also radar imagery, and we are going to see that this is much uh, different in how you acquire the, Im the imagery. And much more, so just wait. <laughs> So Copernicus. Copernicus is a flagship program of the European Union, which is aimed at monitoring the Earth, its environment, and the ecosystem, but not only. Also, and this is a very important role, to prepare us against crisis, security risks, and man-made or natural disaster, which, as you, as you noticed, in recent times, also because of climate change, they have been increasing. Then, What's the best part of Copernicus is that all the data and information are full, free, and open. And again, because you are paying as taxpayers the program, so the European Commission said, look, I will pay with those money the satellites, but then what you get from the satellites, I make it available for free to the European citizens. This is extremely important. And then it's a tool for economic development, because, for example, imagine you will be, you know, maybe, or you are, you are today a startupper. You say, I'm very good, uh, I'm a very good programmer, I, I'm a very good software developer. I'm, I'm not happy with what Copernicus is giving. I can play a lot with the data. I can create additional information. You use the freely available data, you add value on that, and you make money. So it's also a tool for uh, economic development, development. So satellites at the service of the citizens. Don't worry, I will not speak about money, but <laughs> this is just to let you understand that this is a very serious program with a lot of money in it. Imagine, the idea of using the satellites for the benefit of the entire society in, within the European Union uh, is from 1998. Some uh, very good guys may, uh, m met in the north of Italy in a beautiful location close to Lago Maggiore, and then they said, okay, let's, let's do this, in 1998. And then, 
okay, a lot of discussion, bureaucracy, blah, 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 until we, we reached the 2008 for the pre-operational phase, and then 2014 for the operational phase. We just started three years ago to give data on an operational basis, and we have a budget of 4.3 billion euro, a lot of money, as you know, until 2020. And then next year, they will understand how much money, maybe hopefully more, to put for the next year. But let's understand what we are talking about. So Copernicus is not only about satellites. Satellites represent the space component, but then we have the services, which you can imagine the services as a cook in a restaurant. The satellite data are the raw data. They come, they are very big, like several gigabytes maybe for one, uh, one image. And then the cook, the, the service providers, they say, okay, let's make this data more beautiful. They cook w very well this data, and they serve it to you. And you are the user, like a, a client in a restaurant. You take the data, which are cooked, which are very prepared, and they, are become, they have become information. But today, indeed, we will focus on space, because this is the cool part. <laughs> At least for me, eh? because I'm a space engineer, so I don't want to go against the ones that say, ah, no, I don't like the satellites. And then we have, in addition to the satellites, also the in situ component. In situ is a Latin expression uh, which means on the ground. These are sensors which are placed on a lot of places on the Earth, which serve for two reasons. One is to complement what cannot be measured by satellite, and there is a lot, unfortunately, that cannot be measured by satellite, and then to validate the satellite measurements. Okay, we have currently a lot of satellites in orbit, which are called the Sentinels. We have Sentinel-1 up to Sentinel-6. We have launched the two Sentinel-1, two Sentinel-2, one Sentinel-3, and the brother satellite will be launched very soon, early 2018. Then Sentinel-5 precursor, we are going to see all of them now. Eh? Sentinel-4, Sentinel-5, and Sentinel-6 to be launched. Uh, we will reach the full constellation, let's say, by 2022, which is the, the full deployment of the program. But let's understand now where these satellites are placed. So we have one of the most important orbits, which is a low Earth orbit, or, orbit, or LEO. This is an orbit that goes um, between uh, 400 and 1,500 kilometers. So as you can see from this picture, it's very, very close to us. So the satellites, OK, they're, they're very up in the sky, but not too much. Eh? They're kind of close. Then you have the high elliptical orbit, this, uh, the elliptical one, which stands out. This was mainly used in the past for military purposes. You know, uh, during the Cold, World, um, the Cold War, the Russians, because of their, their geo geographic location, they used to have satellites in this orbit because these satellites, they spend a lot of time on the apogee when they are far away. And you can imagine what the apogee was. It was the United States. <laughs> they were observing, uh, they were spying on, uh, on Washington, D.C. This is uh, how, how the orbits can be useful for different purposes. And then we have the medium Earth orbit, which they are characterized by a very harsh environment. It's not very, it's not very good for, to, for the satellites to stay there. And nowadays we have mainly navigation satellites, like GPS, like Galileo, GLONASS. And uh, for uh, engineering optimization processes, they are placed there. But m most, most of the... Okay, satellites are navigation satellites. And then, last but not least, we have the geostationary Earth orbit, the farthest uh, away in this diagram, which is 36,000 kilometers, almost, not, uh, not exactly 36,000, uh, as a um, um, height in the sky. And this, we are going to understand why this is uh, very important. For what concerns low Earth orbit, the first one that I described, this is one of the most interesting for the majority of the satellites which are observing the Earth. And a characteristic of this orbit, if placed in, a, in the correct inclination, is the fact of being sun-synchronous. If uh, we can play with the guys uh, down there uh, the short video, we will understand what does this mean. Thank you very much. If. OK, <laughs> so I will, I will start. As you see, look at the orbit. It keeps the same illumination condition. It means that the satellite crosses the equator at the same local time. So you can imagine how useful is this for scientists or for people that want the data. 
at different times of the year with the same illumination condition. And you see the orbit, while traveling around the sun, it kind of turns together with the sun. You see, it keeps the same inclination. This is extremely useful for several applications. And as you will encounter, the vast majority of the Earth observation satellites are in this orbit. But now, let's see one by one these beautiful uh, pieces of hardware. Just to let you understand uh, how complex can be this machine. From the design phase to the launch, this can cost uh, a loan from half a billion euro to 800 million euro. Just to, to show you the, the complexity of the sensor. This is a radar satellite. So let's say is the, the least counterintuitive uh, remote sensing device. It's, it's a, re a relatively low orbit, 700 kilometers, 98 degrees inclination. So this orbit is called the quasi-polar. <laughs> 90 degrees would be perfectly polar. We have two in orbit, and it is useful for all these application domain, land, marine, emergency, climate. But let's understand why. So if the intuitive part of remote sensing is, is that you go on orbit and you shoot picture, this one is as different to that one as are our eyes to our ears. With the radar, we send energy pulses, and then we, we hear how the Earth responds. Because the Earth has different uh, properties, the soil. So the roughness, for example, it uh, basically reflects, backscatter the energy in different ways. And the satellite is, is hearing, oh, th this is what I get back. And the, the good, very good part of this sensor it can, uh, is it that it can see on, it can hear <laughs> through clouds and aids and take pictures at night. This is a very good advantage because if you go with your phone and the, the earth is dark, you, your picture will be dark. So if we can play also this small uh, animation, you see, this is how Sentinel-1 images the earth. As you can see, because the orbit is low, the footprint is not uh, let's say relatively big because it can because this is what uh, what it can do. So we need several orbits to go around the Earth and to cover the entire Earth. But <laughs> I will show you. So look at this beautiful picture. This is a picture uh, taken uh, thanks to Sentinel One. The first months of the operation of the satellites. This is the island of Capo Verde. There was a terrible uh, eruption of a volcano. This is an interferogram, so it's a comparison of two radar images. One was taken before the event, one was taken a few days after. And you compare the image, and these different colors tells you the ground displacement, so of how much the ground was displaced. And the accuracy of this is a centimeter accuracy. So can you imagine with a satellite which is 700 kilometers away, I can tell you that this, this part in reddish has moved maybe by three centimeters because of the event. So imagine giving these uh, image, images uh, constantly to ge geologists. They will say, OK, this is, this is great for me, because now I can understand maybe what's going on uh, uh, below the Earth. What's, uh, what are the, di the dynamics of the lava flow, for example? And this is just... Uh, one single example, I, I chose it because also the, the picture was very beautiful. <laughs> uh, so two satellites in orbit for Sentinel-1, and you see these are the strips around the Earth. So you can imagine that uh, I, it takes some time to cover the entire Earth. And it takes uh, several days. So let's say between five and, sen and seven days, I am able to go over the same spot on Earth and, and then cover the entire globe. And of course, you will always have people saying, ah, come on, seven days. I need uh, and the same image every few hours. OK, then you need to launch uh, 30 satellites. <laughs> 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 you, oh, there will be always uh, some users some, as, as you go. As in the restaurant, there will always be somebody complaining. <laughs> uh, so Sentinel-2, again, we go, we go back to the pictures. So this is the, the, com the, um, the complicated and very expensive smartphone in, uh, in space. It is more or less at the, the same altitude of the other. This is 100 kilometers higher. And just to, to let 
to give you an idea of why they are flying so low. Because if, if I go farther away, then my image can be bigger, and then I will cover the Earth more frequently. So you, you, you could ask, why, why they don't do it? Why they place it so low? Well, it's the same if I want to take a picture of you. If I come closer to you, the definition will be much better. So this is the limitation of the, of the instrument. We want to shoot beautiful pictures with very high resolution. I want to be as close as possible. So it is always a trade-off. We have two of them in orbit. Again, this, is, this works like our eyes. So we have the incident solar radiation. It eats the ground or the atmosphere. Then it, it comes back, and, and, and we record it. And this is also called the passive sensor. So optical sensors are passive sensors, because they get what they receive. While radar, I can program the pulses of energy, so they are also called active sensors. So what is the visible spectrum? With the visible spectrum, we call it like this, because this is what we see with our eyes. So the famous red, green, and blue colors. These are the spectral bands of our eyes. And you see, they are very limited. The spectrum is very, very large. And the satellites, they are not limited in, the, in this sense as our eyes. And they can enlarge the potential of measuring other spectral bands. And as we will see, for remote sensing, we are interested in not only the visible light, but near infrared, short wave infrared, and long wave infrared. This is what Sentinel-2 can do. It has 13 spectral bands. I'm not going into the detail of this slide, because other we, otherwise I might bore some of you. But all of these uh, spectral bands are useful for some application. And since Sentinel-2 is mostly a satellite for um, imaging the land and the vegetation and the land cover change, of course, the spectral bands that they selected, the engineers, are mostly for vegetation. Look at here. This is a beautiful composite of Africa taken with Sentinel-2, 7,000 pictures of Sentinel-2, of course, at different times. Cloud-free, almost cloud-free. This is uh, what you can do with freely available data. And here, this is one of my best pictures of today, uh, at least uh, for me. This is an algae bloom. So as you know, algae are uh, organisms that live in the water. As I, I, I guess you can spot the white dot there. It's a boat, the white dot in the picture. So you can imagine how big, how large is this area, several kilometers. This is an algae bloom. Algae can be dangerous, not only for humans, but also for the ecosystem. So, see this structure? This is an algal storm. Of course, I, uh, I, get, I, I need to stop here telling the story about this because I'm not uh, an expert of the sea ecosystem, but imagine what the, the experts can do with this picture. If they receive it, uh, if they receive them constantly, they can understand the dynamics of this ecosystem, how the algal storm develops. It's an, an incredible source of resources for free. OK, here I just wanted to put a beautiful picture of Rome, because I come from Rome, so I wanted to put my, <laughs> my region. But here you also see, uh, and sorry for the Italian accent, by the way, yeah, because uh, <laughs> uh, no, again, uh, Stephen with the beautiful English. Huh? <laughs> so uh, here you have a wealth of information, even though, OK, you, you could print it and put it as a poster, but you see the land, you see the the urban part, the Rome part, the lakes, and then the different colors of the sea, which are linked to transparency, water quality, water depth. So a lot of information behind one simple image, apparently simple. Then Sentinel-3. Sentinel-3 has a sensor which is uh, similar to Sentinel-2, but with lower resolution, because it has different purposes. It's to monitor the sea. In the sea, you don't want to have like 10 meter resolution, 100, 300, it's OK. And then it has a radar altimeter. And uh, let's understand, uh, we will understand how the radar altimeter works. It's very similar to Sentinel-1 in some, somehow. Before we saw the algal storm, this is at global level, the algal pigment concentration, because they do algae, they, they can do photosynthesis. So, through specific spectral bands on the satellite, we can produce these beautiful maps at global scale like this, 14-day composite. 
and you can renew this. So you, you can see how it develops throughout the year. And uh, okay, you can also take uh, pictures of these very unfortunate events like Hurricane Irma, but from here you can see the magnitude of this hurricane, the extent, the diameter, which is bigger than Florida and Cuba. So it's something, uh, extreme events which uh, they, they became more frequent. We are going to see also later. So coming to the second uh, instrument on board, the radar altimeter, we use basically the ranging capability of radar. So again, we send the signal, we hear what's coming back, we measure the time and we, we say, okay, this is uh, 700 kilometers for me. So we can measure, for example, sea surface height, but not only, you can measure the topography also of land. Then if uh, Mil, we can play also this other video, thank you very much. This is the satellite going, Sentinel-3. I have a reference, I have a reference uh, sea surface um, level, which was provided to me by some other satellites or other mission. And then I can see, I can measure the anomaly. This is a very basic measurement eh, of, this, uh, of this satellite. You see, you measure the anomaly, and you can do this again for the entire Earth. Plus, of course, you need to be careful, because if you take data all the time, and then you need to download this data. And you see the ground station, uh, not always. So uh, it, it is an optimization process. Usually satellites, they acquire images for 20, 25, 30% of the time, but they cannot go to 100%, because otherwise uh, you, you acquire the few terabytes of data, but you can download only a few gigabytes, so uh, <laughs> you're stuck. You see, how long does it take to cover the, the Earth? And again, here you will say, come on, guys, I want data faster, you need more satellite, blah, blah, blah. But you, you need to tell him, okay, just give me half a billion more. If you give me half a billion more, I will, I will send another, uh, another altimeter. <laughs> Okay, Sentinel-4, now we are entering the atmospheric chemistry composition domain. So, Sentinel-4 is in a particular orbit, as I said before, which is geostationary Earth orbit at 36,000 kilometers, so much, much higher than Sentinel-1, 2, and 3. It is for air quality measurements, which you know nowadays it's extremely important. A lot of people... Uh, are dying because of the bad air quality. So it's not something, okay, let's measure air quality. It could, uh, it could change uh, our life. It could save many lives. And then the ozone, you know how the ozone layer is important. Then solar radiation. For example, Copernicus is providing data to many users, which help them understand where to put the solar panels on, the, on their houses, which are the best regions. So it's really something concrete, something practical. And then climate monitoring, which is super important. This is the orbit that we'll have, because it's not been launched, Sentinel-4. You see, the satellite moves at the same speed of one point to the Earth. So I see the same scene every time. And this is what you look, it's beautiful. Compare this to what is imaged by the previous satellites. The difference is huge. This kind of images, we first got them only in 1972 when the first meteorological satellites were launched. So imagine, it's something pretty recent. And then Sentinel-5, precursor, P stands for precursor, which was launched uh, on the 13th of October, very recently. It will be, again, for atmospheric chemistry composition monitoring, but it will be on an orbit which is similar to Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and Sentinel-3, so a, a lower orbit. And then Sentinel-5, will come. So Sentinel-5 precursor will fill the gap because the, uh, the people need the data today. They cannot wait 2020. So they launched one satellite now. They will launch Sentinel-5 uh, later. Again, air quality measurements, stratospheric ozone, solar radiation, and climate. And then you will measure all these cases, but uh, it's not the point uh, today. Then last but not least, Sentinel-6. Sentinel-6 is another altimeter, so his main mission objective is to measure sea surface height, like we discussed. If you want to see where these satellites are now, you, you can just go on the Google Play Store or in, uh, the Apple Store, you download the ESA Sentinel app, and you, you see where they are now, when they will acquire picture, 
and which kind of data you can have. If you want, you can also do it now and not follow my presentation anymore. <laughs> but then, just to, just to show you, uh, these satellites have been planned in a way such that when one dies, you, you know, the, the average uh, lifetime of these satellites is seven, eight years. But since they are very well done, sometimes they go up to 11, 12, so that's very good. But the nominal life, and they need to arrive to that life, is seven, eight years. So, uh, more or less, every seven, eight years, you need to launch. So we are already, the, the replenishment of the constellation is already planned. So starting from 2020, we will launch already the Sentinel-1C, so the first satellite, D. So continuity is key. This is the most important aspect of an, of an operational program like Copernicus. Because science program, they can say, okay, we do an experiment, then we analyze the data, then maybe we launch another mission. They don't really care about continuity, but uh, a biologist or a ge geologist, uh, they need data constantly. They cannot say, okay, now the satellite is dead, let's wait two years. No, <laughs> I need the data every, <laughs> every day, every week. So continuity is key. But then, can six families of, sun, of satellites in your opinion meet all the requirements of all the society from agriculture to forestry to emergency management? No. So there is a lot of international cooperation going on. And the European Commission also buys data from international mission, from American mission, from Russian mission, from Japanese mission, and from other nation mission. Maybe in the future also Chinese missions. Why not? And uh, they use this data to complement what they offer today. And then uh, we discuss the satellite part. Now let's understand where the, the famous cooks come into play, so the service providers. These are mainly expert institutions which, they, which have uh, a lot of experience with playing with the data and serving it to the, to the clients. And for the moment, today, we have six services, land, marine, atmosphere, climate change, security, and emergency management. Let's understand what, uh, what are they doing. Land, you can only imagine how, how vast in, is the land domain. So we go from ecosystem monitoring, biodiversity, agriculture, forestry, energy, natural resources, the water cycle, urban planning, it's huge. So you need an expert actor which is working on this information and give it to you. We have the global component, so we measure with a pretty coarse resolution from one to 10 kilometers parameters at global stake, at uh, uh, global uh, level. And we, we deliver it to the users every 10 uh, to 15 days. Then we have the pan-European component with higher resolution uh, data, because of course the, the program, okay, is international, but it's a European program. So we want to observe better Europe than the other nations. <laughs> and then the local component. So we, for example, we have uh, a collection of biodiversity sites, because you know, Europe is rich. All, this, all our nations are rich of special sites where a special type of trees or type of animals live. We need to protect this. It's our, uh, it's our heritage. So we need for this very high resolution. And so the land component is also buying very high resolution data between one and five meter pixel to monitor the local component. Then marine. In the case of marine, satellites can measure a, a, a limited set of parameters. So it's, we, can, we can even list them. Sea level, ocean salinity, and actually the satellites can only measure sea surface salinity because they look from above, they cannot go underwater. And so we need, as, as I said before, in situ the, uh, sensors to go. So we send a boat and we measure the bottom of the ocean. Then ocean temperature. Again, the satellites measure sea surface temperature. Sea ice, this is extremely important, uh, for, for example, for the transport industry. Let's imagine um, nations like Finland, Norway, that are active in transportation on the North Pole, which unfortunately, okay, we are losing ice uh, there because of climate change, but it opened in recent years possibilities. You can, uh, you can cut your path to go, for example, on the other side of the globe. But you need to have maps about sea ice, because even a, a block of ice of uh, six or seven meters can, br can break your boat. 
And then wind, wind direction, for, uh, it's useful for fishery, for uh, offshore uh, oil and gas industry. They want to know the intensity of the wind on the surface. Then ocean currents, sea surface currents, and the ocean color, a so-called ocean color, which is linked to, to biology, like we, we saw before, the algal storms, uh, etc. Then, atmosphere monitoring, of course it deals with everything which is air quality and atmospheric monitoring climate forcing, so all the variables linked to climate, and solar radiation. Like we said, the, for example, the radiation on Earth for the solar plant or solar farm, or also your solar panel on your, on your house for the design of these systems. And then emissions of, of, of uh, surface fluxes. As you know, uh, today we are polluting a lot. It is extremely important then to understand, first of all, how much we are polluting, how much greenhouse gases are we putting into the atmosphere, and also who is polluting the most, because we need to take actions. We, we had an agreement two years ago called the Paris Agreement at the Conference of the Parties, the United Nations Conference for on Climate Change. And they said, okay, we need to reduce the emission, uh, but these were mostly political statements, but we need to support this with factual data we need to send satellites that can measure this. And for example, we will not see it today, but it's a future planned satellite. There will be a Sentinel-7 in 2026, hopefully, otherwise 2027, 2028, which will launch with an unprecedented precision, with one kilometer resolution, the CO2 emissions at global level. So imagine how powerful it could be. In, in the hands of the policy makers, which, which tells you, hey, uh, Italy, you need to pollute uh, less, come on. <laughs> so, climate is a priority, climate change is a priority, the satellites help us to demonstrate that climate change is real. Climate change is happening, we are acting on the environment. Climate change has, has always been there, eh? climate change is not something that uh, the, the humans do. It's a natural process of the Earth. But the fact is that normal climate change takes ages, years, centuries. It's uh, the Earth finding its own equilibrium. We had times where the atmosphere of the Earth was full of uh, toxic, toxic gases. But then slowly the equilibrium was found. And now we live, since uh, a lot of thousand years, in a pretty stable equilibrium. And now, with our main activities, we are accelerating this. And this is linked also to these extreme events, like hurricanes, uh, uh, storms, which are stronger and stronger, like they shouldn't be, and like they were not in the past. Just to give you a clear example, it's a, it's a much more complex situation, but the, the strength of an hurricane is directly linked to the sea surface temperature. So if the sea is hotter, the hurricane will be stronger. Of course, it's not so straightforward, but it's directly linked. So. Climate is a priority. And now let's play, just to show you, uh, thanks, uh, Mil. This is a comparison. We, we took the average from 1981 on, of the surface air temperature. We take the average, 1981, 2016, and we say, okay, this average is a value, I don't know, of 15 degrees, okay? 15 degrees uh, Celsius. And then we see what's, what was the evolution between 1981 is the beginning of the very hard industrialization, uh, the third industrialization, also with China coming into play. You know, China is the most polluting country, but it's also because of this, of the population. If you take the ratio between the pollution and the citizens, the United States are the most polluting country. But then, overall, in absolute value, China, for the moment, is the the worst, let's say. But they are taking a lot of measures to reduce. You see, now we went to the red zone. Look at this, uh, this is terrible. Eh? This was also unexpected. So you see there at 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So a change and increases in uh, the equilibrium temperature of 0 0.6, 0 0.7 degrees is huge. You need to trust me because <laughs> again, otherwise we will need one more hour to explain why this is huge. But you need to trust me, this is very terrible. And uh, zero 0.1, zero 0.2 could be something acceptable, but this is not good. So we really need to take uh, action. And uh, luckily we will demonstrate it with satellite. We will, uh, we will push 
the politicians or the, the people that uh, are in a position to take a decision to move the countries to do something with this. And then emergency management, which is also related to climate change. So we need to be prepared against, again, these hurricanes, earthquake, volcano eruption. First of all, it's a matter of saving lives. This is the first. This is, the, of course, the, the most uh, important uh, principle. So we need to save from these disasters as many people as possible. But then it's also a way of saving money. Imagine how much does it cost the, the activities to, to then reconstruct uh, uh, recovery activity after a disaster. It's million and million and million of euros. So satellites can also help in that. So we, we, we can produce pre-disaster maps and then post-disaster maps. Here you see a grading map. This, this is a post-disaster uh, map. This city uh, is very close to my heart. It's very close to the village of my grandparents. And this Amatrice. When you go to a good Italian restaurant, I know you have many here in Sofia. I've tried already some. And you ask for a matriciana pasta. Yeah, I, I guess at least some of, of you should know. <laughs> uh, a matriciana pasta was uh, invented, if you can say, it was invented in this city, one hour and a half driving from Rome, which was unfortunately destroyed by the earthquake uh, one year ago. Uh, the city center, which was also of, of uh, high cultural heritage importance, completely destroyed. With this map, with the red uh, squares, you see what is completely destroyed. And then uh, with the relatively lighter colors, orange, uh, yellow, etc., you see the parts which are partially destroyed and then the, the non-destroyed ones. So thanks to this, this map was produced by in very high resolution data, even uh, sub-meter resolution pixel from French and American missions, was paid again with our money to give them to the Italian civil protection to help the post-disaster phase. Then the last service, security, it has three main components, border surveillance, maritime surveillance, support to external action. This is a very particular service. And actually, you, as normal citizens, cannot activate this. There are uh, authorized users which re request an activation when needed. And just to, to let you understand when this is used, uh, as, you, as you saw from the news, uh, in recent months, there was a huge problem with migrants in Italy. A lot of migrants were coming to the south of Italy, poor people, of course. Uh, and we had to monitor this. And uh, so the... This Copernicus service was activated, and actually they spotted all the, all the boats that were very close, very close uh, to the African coasts, and they should not have been there. They should be in international water, because you need to rescue the migrants. You, then, you don't need to pick the migrants and then bring them to Italy. So you see, this kind of information is extremely useful also for political decision. OK, but then, OK, we saw the space component, the beautiful satellites, we saw the services. Now, where, where do you get the data? Well, there are several portals. If you are a good cook <laughs> with the satellite data, and you say, I don't need somebody, I'm very good, I'm a remote sensing expert. I don't need somebody to, to give me uh, process data. I want the raw, I want the raw stuff. Then you can go to the to the hub of the European Space Agency, you download this directly for you, this huge uh, uh, amount of data. Otherwise, if you are, for example, a farmer and you want the land-related data and information, you go to land.copernicus.eu and there you find all the products for relevant to you. And then if you, if you are a marine biologist, you go in marine.copernicus.eu. Now, just uh, for you to play when you, when you go back home, if we can open, uh, thank you, uh, this uh, website, Sentinel Hub. This is an Earth Observation brow Browser, freely available, which lets you navigate through the Sentinel images. And not only the Sentinel, also other freely available satellites. We go to Applications. You write Sofia, 
and you find the latest pictures of Sofia. In this case, um, I think you find pictures from uh, two weeks ago or 10 days ago. So extremely updated pictures. OK, we can go back huh, to the presentation. <laughs> Uh, and then you can also apply filters. Of course, it's not a uh, professional filter, but you apply filters. And for example, you, you check the status of, uh, of the vegetation around the city. And it's beautiful because you, you, it, in one click, you understand. So again, all the satellites for all these applications, from climate change to security, uh, development and cooperation, tourism, really numerous applications, and many, many more that uh, I put uh, here. <laughs> so I, I hope you enjoyed it. As you see, space is like uh, very fascinating, but has also different aspects. Today we looked at how satellites are useful for our everyday life, but also linking to the previous presentation, space science is fundamental for uh, also to answer our philosophical question. So human exploration should be always be there and funded and researched on uh, this field should never be stopped because uh, for sure we are not alone. Okay, this is my belief. <laughs> so this is extremely important. This is a con concrete result of uh, space science applied to the Earth, Earth observation, but we should also strive one day to leave our cradle and maybe to find uh, new homes. So research for space exploration, advanced propulsion, uh, mission to Mars as a first step, whatever, coming back to the moon, never stop this because otherwise we will ask the same questions again and again. Thank you very much.